Okay. Um, thanks for coming to the final uh, seminar for the Chaos Seminar Series for this semester. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have uh, our speaker, uh, Michael Riemer uh, from uh, Germany. Uh, Michael got his PhD uh, at Karlsruhe uh, University and uh, in 2007. After that, he actually came to the US and did a National Research Council postdoc uh, from 2007 to 2010 at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, and then uh, he returned to Germany, uh, joined uh, Mainz, uh, and uh, is now a academic uh, Oberat uh, there. Uh, I don't think there is any real equivalent here, but I think the closest uh, to the US system is uh, associate professor. Uh, and uh, he's been doing research, uh, very interesting research on atmospheric dynamics, predictability and stuff. So I met him uh, about 10 years ago when I visited, uh, visited Mainz. Uh, and uh, we actually collaborated on a uh, review paper on on Rossby Wave Packet uh, a few years ago. So uh, I think he's going to discuss a little bit about Rossby Wave Packet today. Uh, but uh, his the the title of the talk is "Limits of Predictability: Insights from the Perspective of Atmospheric Dynamics." Uh, so yours. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Edmund. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and giving me the opportunity here to to present some of my some of the work of my of the the recent years. So um, this is in in collaboration with um, or work was mostly done by um, a former PhD student of mine, Marlene Baumgart, and a former postdoc of mine, Franzi Teubler, and it's also in collaboration with uh, Toby Seltz and George Craig um, from Munich. And I understand that George also gave a presentation to your seminar. I think. Uh, one or two years ago, there will be a, a bit of an overlap, but I, I, I think I, I, I do give the, the material here quite a bit of a different twist. Um, the work was mostly done in a, in a collaborative research center. That's what the funding instrument is called from the German Science Foundation. And that center was called Waves to Weather. Um, and it was mostly research on, on predictability. Um, but unfortunately, that program has has ended mid this year. So um, let's see how I can. There we go. Um, so this is about a forty-five to fifty minutes talk. So it's probably fine to have a, have an outline here. Um, first, I, I try to get a few definitions out of the way, and um, I post it here in a somewhat provocative way and asking if predictability is a fundamental or applied science. And then I talk about the, the role of atmospheric dynamics in, in predictability. So setting settings the stage of um, what then will be our main diagnostic tool that we use. Uh, that's the potential vorticity perspective. And then I talk about the new results that we gained um, from that perspective. And if time allows, I'll talk a bit about a topic that is my, my most recent interest that um, yeah, I, I would describe as beyond the synoptic scale. So um, predictability, fundamental science or applied science. So this is also partly a, a tale of my, my, my personal ignorance when I first got into the, um, the field. So let me start with pointing out that the, the science of weather prediction has been a great success story and something that some call a, a quiet revolution um, I'm sure you've seen um, charts like this before. They show the, the skill of forecasts, um, how it evolves over time. And you see all the curves are go up for different lead times for different centers. And on average, the skill has increased. Um, so a skillful forecast can be made one day longer per decade. Um, so, when we look at this curve, we, we sort of ask questions as how good are our forecasts and how have 
they improved over time. And this is this is a question about the forecast models that we have about the parameterizations involved, the resolutions that we can afford, or data assimilation improvements. And this is what I would call practical predictability. So what a specific forecast system can do for us. And similar, if we then go into a bit more detail in evaluating models and asking how well do they um, predict precipitation or how well do they predict the uh, weather regimes on the, um, on the longer time scales, um, it's mostly about errors um, in, in our model formulation biases that we produce, um, again, the, the parameterizations. So this is uh, what, if we study the forecast system, I would call this practical predictability. And this is of course highly important work, but when I came into the field and saw presentations in this direct, direction, I was asking myself, how, how as an atmospheric dynamicist could I, could I contribute here? And, to be honest, I did not really find an answer to that question. Um, but fortunately, predictability comes in in, in a different flavor also. Um, and this is a, a plot that we show a lot. It's from a study of Mark Rodwell and colleagues in 2013. Again, for, for different um for, for different days, the forecast skill um shown as correlation coefficient, um, and for for the sake of suspension, I, I widened out a part here. But as you see the, so we look at um, the, the skill of different forecast centers and we see usually our six day forecasts are fairly skillful and there are differences between the, the centers. Um, some days, some, the one center is better and then another day, another center is more, more skillful. But then what, what happened here in early to mid April is that um, pretty much all of the, the forecast produced, um, uh, all of the centers produced forecasts that had no skill at all um, for a six day forecast. And one can debate whether this is because all the models had um, the same deficiency or whether this is actually a characteristic of the atmospheric state. And there are strong reasons to believe that this is um, actually intrinsic to the atmosphere. So that we look at here a, a forecast situation that intrinsically, so as a as a characteristic of the atmosphere, is very hard to predict. And this intrinsic predictability, so predictability as a characteristic of the atmospheric state, will be our focus here. And of course, what that implies simply is that the well-known fact that predictability is flow dependent. That's the the whole reason why we run ensemble forecast systems. Um, to try to, to cover this flow dependence of the predictability. And when we consider predictability from this perspective, it actually becomes a, a very intriguing dynamics problem. So I'm, I'm sure you've all, all seen such a, such, a, such a graph before. So the, the, the general concept of an, of an ensemble forecast, we sort of accept that we cannot describe the atmospheric state precisely in terms of our initial conditions. So this is indicated by this. Actually, do you, do you see my mouse? If I move it around on the screen, probably. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I okay. see that. Yeah. So here on the left-hand side, we have a little indication of a probability density function of our atmospheric state. It's fairly tight. So we have a good estimate of the, of the initial state, but we don't know it it precisely, and then we run our models forward in time from these many different initial conditions, and then the, the solutions somewhat diverge. So from a dynamics perspective, one can now ask the question, or one can now try to understand all these different evolutions that could have been. Um, and in that sense, it, it becomes a formidable um, uh, a problem. So not only understanding one of the evolutions, but all others that could have been also. And if we, so if we seek our conceptual understanding of how these evolutions diverge, what we would achieve then is actually a dynamical understanding of the, of the atmosphere intrinsic predictability. And that is, that is the bit that I got very interested in. So um, let's now review the role of the atmospheric dynamics in, in predictability. Um, so again, this, this picture, say 
um, assume that the black line here is the, the true evolution of the of the atmosphere and our forecast is the is the red line. So we could describe our forecast as um, the true state. So our our um, so the, the 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 capital X here defining the the atmospheric state, if you like. So the the true state is the capital the black capital X, and we can describe our forecast as the red capital X as the true state plus some perturbation of it. And then the question is, how does this perturbation evolve or this difference evolve in time? And that is more generally referred to as perturbation dynamics, uh, but in the predictability uh, context, it's usually re referred to as error growth. So whenever I talk about error growth, I really mean how small deviations between model runs or between an, a forecast and an analysis evolve in time. And also in a in an uncertainty context of ensembles, I, I simply call it error growth. So the what I think what the dominant or at least the traditional view is on on the dynamics of errors um, is um, yeah is based on 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 Lawrence ingenious model from from his sixty nine paper. Um, so let me. <laughs> Let me emphasize, I really think that this is, 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 a, is an ingenious piece of work, although I will, will mostly talk about the, the limitations that it has. Um, so the model here, the, the underlying dynamics is, is the 2D vorticity equation and scale interactions in, this, in, the, in the model are modeled as if the, 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 the fluid would be um, homogeneous in isotropic turbulence. So and there are two major implications from that model. The one is that it emphasizes the role of the background kinetic energy spectrum um, for the error growth. So if you if you have seen work on predictability, it all it often um, involves discussion about the slope of the background kinetic energy spectrum, whether it's B minus by third or E and a minus three. Um, range and whether you have upscale or up amplitude scale, uh, up amplitude growth. Um, I will not talk about this here for reasons that I hope become clear later. The other, um, the other consequence from this model that I will talk about is that the model predicts a finite limit of predictability, or what is also referred to as an intrinsic limit of predictability, because that's a characteristic of the atmosphere and no forecast system, whatever good it would be, could sort of break through this limit. Processes that are not included in these models are um, effects of cumulus convection, or baroclinic growth, um, and because it assumes a homogeneous isotropic um, state, it, it, it cannot describe flow dependence. Um, so it lacks um, certain characteristics that from synoptic experience um, we would like to see in that atmosphere. And Lawrence, of course, was very careful um, about the applicability of his model and very um, explicitly noted um, the, the idealizations that, that he made here um, and yeah, mildly suggested that maybe this is applicable to the, to the Earth's atmosphere. And another view that is fairly um, popular, I'd say, is um, that you sort of simply parameterize the error growth dynamics. Um, that is also based on, on work by, by Lawrence. So he used the, um, what is called a logistic growth model. So as you see here in the equation, so the, the V here is the, the error variance, or that's simply the error but the authors here use uh, the capital V for the error. So you see the left-hand side gives us the temporal change of the error. So it does describe the dynamics of the error, but not from a fluid dynamic perspective. It assumes that the growth is linear with the existing error. That's the alpha times capital V term here. And then it assumes that um, growth is kept by a saturation level. And these two, the blue boxes, they, they would define a logistic growth model. And then what the, the new element here is that there's a, a linear term that is independent of the existing model 
um, that that was introduced to to probably um, diagnose the, the effects of model error. So it's a dynamic. It, it, it tells us about the dynamics of the error um, growth, but it doesn't tell us about the underlying fluid dynamical mechanisms. And how such models are, are often used is that you sort of then fit your data to this model, which is now here shown on the right hand side, um, and then you can make arguments about um, yeah about the size of your of your model error basically. So the extent that you um, that you project on this linear growth, independent of the existing error, you can then interpret as, as, as a model error, which is usually then defined as a beta over here. So, um, and then there, there's, a, there's a third perspective that is fairly popular, um, and that was um, based on Fu Ching Sang's 2007 paper, Fu Ching and colleagues, and, and they hypothesized now actually three stages of, of error growth, in particular how the errors grow from initially very small errors. Um, and this is now a model that I, from synoptic experience, could relate to because it it uh, it assumes or hypothesizes that in a in a first stage, so on the smallest scales, the the errors or perturbations grow in in precipitation features. So on the on the clouds the scale or the con on the scale of convective elements, if you will. Um, then in a second stage. Uh, gravity waves and apotropospheric divergence and adjustment to some balanced state um, would predominate. And then in the third stage, when errors are balanced, um, they would grow with, with baroclinic instability. Um, and so this is th this is the model that got me interested in, in predictability because I could relate to it, as I said, from, from synoptic experience. Um, and it's it actually constitutes a paradigm shift away from the from the Lawrence um, paradigm, um, in that it's um, it introduces multiple stages with different processes, and that's something that the Lawrence model, um, with its uh, underlying turbulence assumption, um, could not produce. But Somewhat unfortunately, um, the, the the study from Fu Ching Sang did not provide a, a diagnostic framework how we could test um, that this hypothesized three stage model of error growth would would actually indeed um, occur in our forecasts or in the in the atmosphere if you, if you like. Um, and then um, what really got me um, hooked up with with error growth dynamics was was a paper by Hugh Davies, Marco Di Done. Um, um, that introduced the, the potential vorticity or short the PV perspective on on error growth. So they would characterize errors not as usual, say with a, with an error kinetic energy, but rather as um, errors in in PV. And the beauty of of PV is that you can consider it a the state the one state variable of your of your atmosphere. At least for that part of the atmosphere that that obeys to a balance um, condition, so you could do this perturbation dynamics simply with with PV, which is super convenient also because PV is simply a, a scalar. So um, essentially, I'll now talk more in detail um, about this this PV perspective and how we can quantify mechanism using this perspective. So. So again, why potential vorticity? Um, it's a scalar, it's a single scalar quantity that completely subsumes the balanced state of the atmosphere. In that sense, it's a very powerful variable and a key quantity in, in atmospheric dynamics. Um, we are here interested in, in errors um, on, on scales large enough to be the balance. You may think of geostrophic balance for definiteness here. And even the growth of small errors, small initial errors would affect, um, eventually affect the balance state. So PV is, is applicable for our purpose. PV comes with a, with a very if you like, simple tendency equation. So we have an equation that describes the evolution of PV with time. 
and that consists in general of two different contributions. First of all, advective tendency. So it's just the wind field that redistributes PV and then um, modification by non-conservative processes. I'm here emphasizing diabetic heating as a process um, and I'll, I'll neglect friction, frictional processes here. Now what you, what you can do, um, what is essentially introduced by um, the first work that I'm uh, aware about is by Chris Davis and Kerry Manuel. You can um, use piecewise P inversion. So you, you identify the interesting pieces um, of PV and derive the wind field that is associated with, um, with these PV anomalies. And then you can um, you can decompose your advective tendency in in different mechanisms, and you can also um, or you should then also complement this by um, also looking at a at a divergent flow because that's not included in the in the balance flow of the PV anomalies. So essentially, you decompose your advective tendencies by piecewise PV inversion. And this Helmholtz partitioning that gives you the, the rotation and the non-divergent winds. And then you say, okay, by this I can identify mechanisms A, B, C. And the same you can do with, uh, with the diabetic processes. And then you get more mechanisms. And, and that's sort of what, so now we have a, we can contribute the evolution of, of PV. So think of it as the state of the atmosphere to different mechanisms. And that's what, what I would refer here to as, as mechanistic understanding, if we can do that. So as an example, hopefully uh, something that um, you, you folks um, at Stony Brooks are familiar with, um, PV tendency in, in Rossby wave packets. Um, so here we'll, we'll look at the PV tendencies at, in the, at, the upper levels of the of the troposphere or the yeah the near tropopause region if you like on on isentropes so more precise, um, precisely isentropes that intersect the middle eddy the tropopause uh, what we looked at is um at i don't know 1500 or some thousand rossby wave packets over 40 year period in error 5 data and then we made composites centered on ridges and troughs um, of, um, of the Rossby wave packets. And I'll here sh show you a, a composite centered on, on, on the trough in a Rossby wave packet. And the, the blue, um, so the, the shading denotes the, the PV anomalies. And you see that the trough shows up on which the composite shows up as a positive PV anomaly and the ridges flanking the trough show up as, as negative PV anomalies. And the blue contour line, solid and dash, now show PV tendencies and PV tendencies here that I would refer to as quasi-barotropic because these are the PV tendencies that are associated with the wind due to the upper tropospheric PV anomalies themselves. So in a sense, it's the the self the self advection of the of the wave if you like or the, the intrinsic propagation so and what you essentially see is the the well known intrinsic propagation of rossby waves that intrinsically they propagate against the westerly flow so we have positive tendencies of pv to the left of the positive anomaly and negative tendencies to its right and this would imply that the positive tendency shifts towards the left. And similar for the uh, analogous argument um, gives you shifts for the for the negative anomalies also. Um, yeah, important to note here that the the tendencies are mostly in quadrature with the with the PV pattern. So that gives you that the propagation pattern. Um, the next tendency I discuss here is the one that is associated with the low level PV anomalies. So the interaction or the, yeah, the interaction or the, the, the impact of the low level PV anomalies on the upper level wave. And that is um, one 
part of, of a baroclinic um, instability. So we, we refer to this as baroclinic amplification. And here we center on the on the ridges. So you see the, the blue anomalies in the center of the plot. Um, the baroclinic tendencies are shown in yellow. And here you can see that they are much more in phase with, with the PV anomalies. We see positive tendencies um, in the trough, so um, overlapping with the positive anomalies and negative anomalies in the ridge, overlapping with the negative um, negative tendencies in the in the negative anomaly of the ridge. So this amplifies our our Rossby wave packets. So what so far what what I show you is is, is simply the the tri baroclinically coupled dynamics of of Rossby waves essentially. And now the, the, the third um, tendency here is, and I should say the, so this decomposition here that you see on the right, that, that's all that is done with, with PV inversion. So essentially we, we only use two PV pieces, the upper tropospheric PV anomalies and the lower tropospheric PV anomalies. And the tendencies we here see is are sort of complete in that sense that it shows all the, the balanced tendencies and the next tendency is now the one uh, associated with the divergent wind at, uh, in the upper troposphere. And this is very much related to latent heat release below. So it's the, the divergent outflow in the upper troposphere of moist processes below. So in terms of, um, of cyclones and ridge building, you can fairly safely think of this as the impact of a, of a warm conveyor belt on the upper troposphere. And here again, we, we composite um, centered on ridges. And the red tendencies are now these tendencies by the divergent wind. And you see the, the large overlap of negative tendencies with the negative anomaly that simply also tells us that these tendencies amplify riches. So with this uh, illustration of the PV tendencies for an example that I would hope you're, you're fairly familiar with, uh, I would hope to yeah, provide some, some illustration of the tendencies that we will now mostly discuss in the following. Um, so now back to the to our forecast errors. So essentially what um what this paper by you Davies and Marco Didone um introduced is um the dynamics of PV differences. So they evaluated the PV tendency of of a forecast um, and subtracted from that the PV tendency equation of, of the analysis. And it's almost as simple as that. What you end up with is a, is a tendency equation of your, of your error. Then you can rearrange terms a little bit to, to make it a bit more easier to, to interpret, but that's, that's essentially all that is. Um, so that is what Davies and Didoni um, introduced and work that I did with um, with my former PhD student Marlene was then essentially to to introduce the piecewise PV or the, the piecewise um, tendency thinking into this PV error um, perspective. And that then gave us the the opportunity to quantify individual contributions to, to error group. So the the final tendency equation that we that we came up with can be thought of a generalization of the of the Lawrence framework because Lawrence also introduced a uh, at a very basic or the, the fundamental level he introduced a, a tendency equation for for errors um, but for vorticity errors and here we we look at PV potential vorticity errors um, so we our delta p here is the PV error we we square it simply so that we have a positive definite error metric. So errors are always positive, even if it's a negative PV error. Um, and then we, we average um, these over, over large areas. In fact, uh, in the work with Marlene, we, we average over the whole Northern Hemisphere. And one term is sort of um, equivalent to the, to, to the Lawrence term in his vorticity equation. And this is this quasi-barotropic um, yet term um, from, from the tropopause dynamics, what I refer to as the intrinsic Rossby wave 
propagation earlier. So that's the, the if you only take the, the upper tropospheric PV anomalies, how they act on themselves, if you like. So that's in a sense, if you think slab wise uh, for the upper troposphere, you can think of this as aspirotropic. And if this um, we would diagnose in a in a turbulent flow, we would we would see the the dependence on the on the um, adikinetic energy spectrum um, hypothesized by by Lawrence. Um, and then we have more terms. Um, one that would show error growth due to baroclinic coupling. So that would be the the, the third stage in the Sang et al. model. Um, we would have we have terms that um, that show the impact of the divergent wind on the error growth. So that would relate. Um, a, it's a bit less clear, but it somehow relates to the second stage of the Sang et al. model. And then we have um, the impact of diabetic heating, the non-conservatives here that we evaluate from parameterizations, and they um, mostly refer to stage one in, in, in Sang et al. So um, now we have a di diagnostic framework um, and would now like to understand the dynamics of, of error growth near the intrinsic limit. Um, and what that is, I'll, I'll start with an introduction of what that, where this intrinsic limit actually comes from. So back to the Lawrence model. So this essentially is the kinetic energy spectrum is here, X axis gives you a horizontal scale increasing to the left. Um, and it just tells you how much kinetic energy you have uh, at what scale. Um, and then Lawrence model assumed you would have at initial time you have an um, your small scales are completely you have no knowledge about the small scales for example because your your, your network of of observations um, does not cover these small scales so you have an error at initial time only restricted to the small scales and what you would then find is that this error grows in time and successively affects larger scales. And here, for example, in this example, um, after five days, scales up to 10,000 kilometers would be, the error would be saturated, so there would be no skill left in a forecast. So now if you were able, by improvements of, so of your observation network to, ah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and this, is, this is called, typically called upscale error growth. So the, the, the fact that the errors at small scales only can limit the predictability at the larger scales. And that of course has to happen due to scale interactions. And, and there comes in the importance of the Lorentz model to model these scale interactions as if the flow would be turbulent. So now say you can reduce your initial error by improving your observational network. Um, you um, you can confine it to smaller scales. What you will then see that um, is that the error will grow again. And say in this example, after four hours, you reach the, the same um, scales as, as previously. And from there on, yeah, the same upscale error growth occurs and you gain these four hours of predictability. So reducing the scale of the initial error, um, error does improve your, your forecast. Now, if you go to um, even smaller scales, what you will find that, um, yeah, you, 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 you see this upscale growth again, and now um, say, but only after 45 minutes, you've now reached the previous level of, 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 of scales. And from there on the same upscale growth um, continues. So, we do see the reduction of or improvement of forecast with the reduction of the scale of the initial error, but we have diminishing returns. So if we go to the smaller scales and ever improve our our um, initial conditions there, we gain less of um, predictability time, if you if you like. And why is that? This is because errors just grow increasingly faster at smaller scales. <clears throat> 
So whenever we say half our the scale of our forecast um, of our initial errors, we do not gain um, the same amount of predictability time, but this amount diminishes. And this diminishes this this asymptotes to an to an to an absolute limit. And this um, this is the intrinsic limit, and this is the the idea of the butterfly effect. So even if the the error would be on a scale of a butterfly, um, they would grow up scale, and they would grow initially at this at these small scales so excessively fast, um, yeah, that that some asymptotic intrinsic limit is is reached. So. To, to 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 examine this the situation, um, we did some things. Um, but here, this is a uh, Toby Seltz um, experiments that he made in in Munich. Um, we did so called error growth experiments. They have a long tradition. Um, you you compare essentially two model runs with with tiny perturbations of the initial conditions, and you make a, a perfect model assumption here. That you assume that your model is um, is good enough or is fairly perfect in um, in representing the growth of of errors. And what we did here is that we we had twelve cases um, arbitrarily started at the first of the month, from October sixteen to September two thousand seventeen, starting from ECMWF analysis. Um, we used the Icon model, which is the the operational model from the German Weather Service. Um, it's global simulations, um, 40 kilometer um, grid spacing. So it needed a convective convection scheme. And that scheme was a stochastic scheme, the stochastic plant Craig st st scheme. Sorry. So and the only difference is um, in these experiments is so it's being in the stochasticity of the scheme. So every scheme was seeded with a rather a random number, so it produced somewhat different um, results from the from the convection. So we introduced in these experiments variability on the on the smallest scale of the model, mimicking um, essentially saturation of the the first stage of error growth in the in Fuching Sang's model. And then we applied this um, PV error diagnostic to it. Um, and this now shows the, the growth rates associated with individual processes by, by forecast, so by, by lead time, essentially. And you, the first thing you see, you see three colors dominating, and you see that the different colors dominate at different lead times. So essentially what, um, what what we confirmed was the idea of um, Zang, Zang et al. of of a multi stage process in in error growth with different processes, and the green curve here dominating in the first twelve hours of the forecast is indeed um, the tendencies that we get from from our convective scheme. So the interpretation is here that error growth is um, by differences in the latent heating that the convective scheme. Um, produces so errors from from convection dominate early on. The second stage then is due to the divergent wind. So um, the idea here is that these differences in the in the diabetic heating below now through the upper tropospheric diabetic outflow um, project onto the onto the tropopause, and in the third stage the blue curve. Now is actually this near tropopause or quasi virotropic term, the one that, that Lawrence had in his, his model also, um, which is essentially a yeah, quasi virotropic dynamics. So, in essence, what we confirmed was the, the hypothesized multi stage model from Sang et al. Um, the, the interpretations of the mechanisms, however, differed for the, for the second and the third stage. Um, so our analysis emphasizes more the interaction um, of the divergent flow with the PV gradient of the jet rather than some adjustment to balance um, process or the, the, the action of inertia gravity waves. And in particular, at stage three, we more find the Lorentz type of nonlinear dynamics rather than 
growth with um, error growth with the borough clinic um, instability. So this is an was an experiment, um, purely a numerical ex academic experiment, if you like, um, seeding the model with with very small initial errors. Um, and the the question, of course, is um, is this relevant for 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 our current day ability to to um, predict the weather? So is do we sometimes reach the the limit of predictability already um and for this question it's it's instructive to first look also at a, of a case study um of of error or uncertainty growth in in an ecmwf ensemble forecast um and this again are the dominant error growth mechanisms with with lead time and looking at an at a, at a forecast that has the current day initial condition errors, um, we see that the, the stage three process, this nonlinear error growth, dominates right from the from the start. So even um, at day uh, sorry at forecast hour one, that the blue curve is is highest um, and and higher than the than the divergent wind here. Um, so this tells us current day forecasts behave uh, are yet quite distinct from um, on average are distinct from from um, what we would expect when we reach the intrinsic limit um, and here I would like to take the opportunity to very briefly talk about um, the flow dependence of of error growth mechanisms because I sort of keep de-emphasizing the, the spiroclinic growth term um, but if we if we look at a map, so this is a polar stereographic view of the of the error tendencies at a specific um, time in this forecast after day four and a half, and um, I encircled an area here with the blue contour, where in the total we see quite strong error growth, um, but the quasi barotropic so the on average dominant term in this region hardly contributes. And this is a region where um, the um, tropical storm Carl underwent extratropical transition. And in this region, we find strong contributions indeed from the borough clinic term and also from the divergent term after four and a half days in the, in the, in the forecast. So um, here I just wanted to mention that flow dependent uh, mechanisms, error growth mechanisms are flow dependent and locally, baroclinic growth can contribute significantly to the errors, but just not on, on average over the whole hemisphere. So now we sort of know that our current day forecasts behave differently as than as what we would expect when we um when we're close to the intrinsic limit. And now that the question was, can we explore this this transition that we would see um from current day? conditions to the intrinsic limit can we explore this a bit more and we set up um, ex numerical experiment to this end now including so the same setup as before but now including also initial condition perturbations and Toby scaled them uh, from 100 percent so it's it's current day amplitude to 50 to 20 percent to 10 percent and to 0.1 percent and the 0.1 percent would pretty much be then again, the, the intrinsic limit. And then analyzing these, uh, these experiments, um, we would sort of first get what we would expect with the current day initial condition uncertainty we see. Um, now it's the, the curve is in green, but the mechanism is the same. We again would see the nonlinear um, growth by quasi-barotropic dynamics to dominate right from the start. And when we then move move to the very small initial condition errors, um, this upscale cascade would dominate with errors first growing very fast um, for about 12 hours um, by diabetic processes. Then the divergent outflow takes over as a dominant process for another 24 to 30, and 36 hours. And then again, the nonlinear dynamics kicks in. So, but now if this experiment is said, we could fill the gap between the 100% and the very tiny initial uh, perturbations. And when we went to 50, so if we halved our current day initial condition uncertainty, 
not much change. But when we would go further to 20 or to 10%, um, we would see that now um, at the earliest lead times, the, um, the diabetic and the divergent tendencies would ramp up and contribute substantially or then with 10% even, even dominate the error growth. So in the, in the interpretation is that once we, re, we reach this small level of initial condition uncertainty, the error growth will be dominated by this very fast error growth from the smallest scales and um, further improvement of the initial conditions would on average not yield further improvements for or further predictability. So um, I think I have a few minutes to to touch on a, on a topic that I'm currently most interested in, and this is what I um, I would refer to as beyond the synoptic scale. And I'll tell you what I mean by this. Um, so it's essentially um, centered around weather regimes. So on the, on the left-hand side here, you see some of the, the PV pattern of um, what is defined as green and blocking over the North Atlantic and, um, and into, into Europe. So these regime patterns are usually defined using some um, some temporal averaging, some there is temporal smoothing of the data, or another um, feature of the atmosphere that you're very familiar with um, that are larger than our our individual synoptic scale systems are Rossby wave packets, and here we indeed focus on the packets as as physical entities in the sense that we focus on the on the waves envelope. So we take out the information of of the phase of individual troughs and ridges and only look at this, this envelope metric. And um, the figure here below this uh, schematic is, is actual data where we only look at, um, yeah, the, exactly this field, the, the Rossby wave envelope threshold um, in some um, appropriate way. Um, and the question I'm interested in is now how how error growth affects these um, these systems, if you will, beyond the synoptic scale. Um, why is this question non-trivial? Why wouldn't the same process just keep keep going? Um, the the first reason, sort of, is that we that we saw in our experiments that the relative importance of processes sort of change. Um, so in these upscale error growth experiments um, that I talked about, um, the, the first one we we looked at PV errors, but we also looked at errors in the in the Rossby wave envelope, so taking out the phase information, and we saw that errors on this in this envelope metric, so which um, that they saturate at later time. So this is the red line here. They saturated at eighteen days, whereas the PV errors with the phase information saturated already after 14 and a half days in these experiments. Um, and when we get to the saturation of the of the PV error, the relative importance of the of the error growth um, mechanisms change. Um, and from another perspective, um, also the kinetic energy spectrum, the background kinetic energy spectrum changes. Um, so for the synoptic scales or from the meso to the synoptic scales, it's this, this classical typical minus three spectrum. Um, but then if we approach the scales of, yeah, five, six, seven thousand kilometers scales, um, continental scale scales, if you like, the, the spectrum actually becomes very flat. So, um, Based on the on 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 the ideas of Lawrence, um, that would have a profound impact on the mechanism that that could or on the on the error growth um, by this nonlinear dynamics. Um, and finally, so our now one of the most the most recent um, study that we are, that we've just submitted to the quarterly journal um, is that we that we looked at the predictability of of Rossby waves packet uh, packets um, in, in, in the NOAA uh, Ensemble EFS 
um, ensemble reforecasts and we we verified um, the forecasts according to how they forecasted the wave envelope. And for that, sort of we, we used what is called a displacement amplitude score, which is a sort of a neat field-based metric. So essentially it, it it's a it's a field deformation algorithm that morphs the forecast field into the analysis field and from that um defines a displacement error and then uh, from the amplitude difference of the morph field um, also an, an amplitude error. And you can combine these both um, bo contribution to a single, to, a, to one single number that gives you a, a score of how good or bad you are. And zero would be a, a perfect forecast here. So we did this for, yeah, more than a thousand Rossby wave packets in this reforecast data. And the result essentially looks like this, it shows up a little bit blurry, but I think it still works. So the, the blue curve, blue greenish curve shows us how the, this, this score increases with time and seemingly starts to approach some, some saturation. Um, so this just tells us that, um, that of course our ability that the, we lose forecast skill um, for the Rossby wave packets with, with time. But then the, the interesting bit here is that with this metric, the increase in this metric, so what we can interpret a, a growth rate in terms of this metric um, maximizes between day four and five. And usually your all, all other error growth analyses that we perform, the, the usual parameterizations of the error growth um, gives you maximal growth, the maximal growth rates at initial time. So there seems to be a qualitative difference between error, errors that um, grow, including phase information and these errors that exclude the, the, the phase information. So, and this is not going to give any answers um, about the problem of um, this, this error growth. It just, um, I just try to make the point here that at least to me, this is a, quite an intriguing open question, this error growth beyond the synoptic scale. And with this, I'll, I'll, um, I'll have my conclusions here. So what we found um, with this uh, intrinsic limit um, um, numerical experiments is that we can, we need to reduce on average um, our initial condition uncertainty by, by 80 to 90% before we reach um, the limits of predictability. So this is sort of good news. There's still lots of improvements to do. And this is not talking about model, model improvements. This is only in the reduction of the initial and condition uncertainty. And that would buy us four to five days lead times. I did not show that. Um, but then after reducing the initial condition uncertainty by that much, um, we would run into the, the regime where the errors grow very rapidly on the smaller scales. So the moist processes in the divergent outflow um, would then project these on the tropopause and that would prevent further, further improvement. And what I would um, now at the, the end sort of emphasize here is that this grow mechanism actually de-emphasizes the role of the slope of the kinetic energy spectrum that was held quite importantly and highly in, in many other um, studies because um, it is not this 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 turbulent like growth mechanisms that we see on the small scale. The, the growth mechanism is different, and there's no reason why that should relate to the kinetic energy spectrum. Um, this also identified this divergent outflow as being the most effective mechanism to to communicate, if you like, the uncertainty in the moist processes to the tropopause, um, and. Then once the tropopause is um, perturbed uh, by a, a sufficient amount, the the nonlinear dynamics take it away. So the actually the mechanism consistent with the Lawrence 69 model um, leads to further growth. Um, what I also tried an extra point here that I would like to remind you also is that we do see the flow dependence of the error growth mechanisms. So not only the the amplitude of error growth is flow dependent, but the mechanisms can change according to different flow situations. And my last point is a sort of a meta conclusion, if you like, is that applying fundamental dynamic concept 
actually help to yield new insights in the in the long standing um, problem that of predictability and opened up new new avenues for 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 research here. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's a very interesting talk. Uh, so let's open up for questions. So anyone uh, have questions? So Brian. Hi, Michael. Well, hi, Brian. Good to see you. Very interesting talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I have a couple of questions, but maybe I'll just think about the first one. Uh, you you did the experiment or you're, you're, you were mentioning about the role of physical parameterizations and, and the upscale growth. And and I, if I understand, you you treat the, the errors in the physical parameterization like the heating and, and so forth sort of randomly, right? Um, uh, you know, stochastically. Uh, and mm -hmm. so I, I was just wondering if you or is there, if you have a parameterization or a model that has a systematic error at a small scale with the heating, you know, because of some bias, uh, does that, how does that impact the predictability, you know, versus sort of a random heating error that occurs, uh, you know, in the model over the first, you know, 12 to 24 hours? Is is there a difference in the, in the growth rates if, if you're kind of hitting the model with a bias of heating in a small scale in certain areas versus randomly? Um, so, yes. So um, it would increase your error growth. Mm -hmm. That's essentially, if you recall this, this, this parameterization, this, this, this equation that parameterizes error growth, the, the linear term that supposedly models um, model error um, that dominates when the initial condition or when the, when the existing error is small. So you ingest a, a an error that that comes from your model into the forecast um, that would not have would not be there if your model would not have this error, hmm. obviously. Um, so that that would increase your your errors for a real forecast. Um, in the experiments that we do, of course, um, making a per perfect model assumption and comparing the model with itself, it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. But for the real world, yes, it it, it decreases your um, your skill. Yeah, it seems yeah, like it's actually, good. Yeah, go ahead, Edmund. Yeah, I actually have a follow up question, which is kind of similar, uh, or all related. So you uh, you you did your experiment with kind of a forty kilometer, or at least one of the experiments with a forty kilometer uh, grid scale. So, and we know that there are systems that are uh, sort of systematic, uh, that there, there are weather systems that are smaller scale than mm -hmm. that. So, and, and it's kind of follow up to Brian's question is that uh, you're assuming that the errors be below that scale would be random, even in your, uh, but, but what happens if you can resolve the smaller scale and still do a perfect model experiment how would that kind of smaller scale error uh, that, uh, 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 would they affect your results? That is a very good thing? question. So, um, so the the argument why it's why we sort of defend this setup as a perfect model is that it, on average, shows good um, error growth characteristics or good growth of uncertainty. So it's for it, it's much better than a deterministic convective scheme, for example, or much it's um it's yeah, it, it's it's significantly better. Um but what we I, I totally agree that there are types of differences in the in the evolutions or the type of error growth that this convective scheme could not capture. And this is associated with convective organization. Uh, because what, what we also found, and, and actually the plan for the next phase of this Waves to Weather project that unfortunately did not get funded, um, was to, to, to do convection permitting global 
error growth experiments and compare with the with the convective scheme. Um, because what we what we did find is convective organization can change um, the the amount of divergent outflow that you get from a system. Um, and even with the same latent heating that is released. Um, so yes, um, it, it it's debatable whether the, the stochastic convective scheme produces, um, I wouldn't defend it for individual cases. I think on average, it's it's fine to emulate, essentially what it does, it, it emulates the, the the growth on the smallest scales and shows the effect of the error growth from the from the convective scale on the on the grid scale of forty kilometers. But I totally agree. I, that's that's very we are very interested in in to see how convection resolving or permitting um, models on the scale would would do the error growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Steve, uh, you've got you've raised your yeah. hand. Hi. Um, <clears throat> this is way outside my area of expertise, um, but I'm intrigued by your second point of uh, rapid error growth associated with moist processes, and I'm guessing that this is a consequence of latent heat, uh, one way or the other. And that, that that's a consequence of the difference between the actual water vapor pressure and the saturation water vapor pressure, which is very sensitive uh, to temperature, for example. So in some sense, thinking back on it, I'm surprised that anybody gets a good forecast even up to four or five days just because of the sensitivity to uh, latent heat and and. Um, to saturation water vapor pressure and, and perhaps I'm getting it wholly wrong, but I'd welcome your comment. Um the I mean the errors do need time to grow up scale. Um so we we do see good forecasts for yeah. for four to five day lead time for scales larger than a few hundred kilometers. Um, but um, below that scale, on a scale of hundred kilometer, two hundred kilometers, it's yeah, it, it's very difficult to to make a good two day forecast. And if you're interested in in in, um, in forecasting the the convective systems, for example, itself, then that has even shorter predictability time scales. And, and um, is, is the is is the culprit in this uh, latent heat? The culprit is probably that there's an there's an instability associated with with um yeah the convective instability. So most convection, uh, most convective instability, and whenever of course you have an, an instability, your your differences would would grow um would grow exponentially. Uh, but it's also in the, the initiation of convection is very hard um, to predict because it depends on, on uh, among other things, on, on boundary layer turbulence. Um, so um, I think it's why in particular convective, most processes associated with convection are so hard to predict are not only due to the sensitivity of the water vapor to temperature, but also due to the processes that initiate and organize convection. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, if there are no other questions, I, I have actually another question, which, yeah, your results for Rossby wave packet seems uh, intriguing to me, yeah, because uh, about 15 years ago, I tried looking at the predictability of Rossby wave packet, the wave envelope, and find that we didn't really predict envelopes better than than the sort of phase information, uh, just by a, a, a sort of 
uh, RMS error or those kind of regular standard metric. But what you sort of suggested is that if you use your metric, you actually get a saturation time that is longer than kind of just the sort of regular uh, predictability, which is intriguing to me. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, we didn't compare with other metrics. Okay. Um, but I mean, what we see is that the errors grow, seem to grow fastest um, at later times. So, yeah. and and we, we are not, our metric does not yet quite saturate after 10 days. Whereas probably, and, and that's from, I mean, you from, from a global refor ensemble reforecast with 25 kilometers or something. So it's not, it's, it's a quite a good model, but it's not the best model that we, that we have. So I, I would assume that, um, that if you take the, the phase information with you, so if you try to take a forecast was be very phase that that you you've lost all skill after ten days already. So yes, in this sense, it seems that we, our study shows that we can predict the or implies that we can predict the envelope better um, than than if we have the phase information. Mm -hmm. What what okay. paper was that that you? I, <laughs> I'm sorry to no, say. No, I, uh, I didn't publish that. Are you because, ah, yeah, okay. because we just looked at that and it didn't. Yeah, because I think in, initially when we when we found the Rossby wave packet phenomenon, we were hoping that because it's larger scale, so the predictability, uh, the error growth would be slower than sort of if we, yeah. if we just look at the regular velocity, for example, the, the, the RMS for the velocity. Uh, but it, well, at least using some fairly sort of standard metrics, we didn't find mm -hmm. that to be the case. And so uh, so that was sort of not something that we pursued uh, further. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think it, it is actually important to, um, to have a skill metric that if it, um, that is not just the standard field-based error metric because that that has the double penalty um, issue mm -hmm. if you try to um, for uh, if you verify something that is coherent in 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 its space so i think that that mm -hmm. was an important and yeah uh, a step for this study and that was uh, um, surprisingly difficult to <laughs> actually implement this and, and get it going yeah but but that's that's very interesting to to hear that um yeah that you had saw somewhat disappointing results for 15 years ago and that with this metric it seems to sort of resolve this disappointment somewhat yeah i think we should talk a little bit after uh, later uh, yeah yeah yes yeah i'd be very happy so yeah any other questions so if not uh we should thank our speaker uh, again with this very interesting talk and yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank you for having me. <laughs>